Uh, human, we met a few years ago online after your wife was diagnosed with Leoma sarcoma and right. you joined one of the online communities I was involved in. That's right, yeah. We, uh, after Amy's diagnosis, we joined ACOR, <coughs> which was probably one of the largest um, LMS communities out there. And it was pretty obvious from the beginning that there was something special about your story. So can you give the audience some background about who Amy and you are, where? Absolutely, where? yeah. Um, <coughs> Amy um, was a, uh, an anesthesiologist and intensive care physician. Um, she um, early on had been her high school's valedictorian, had graduated Phi Beta Kappa, a golden key from, from college. <coughs> uh, went to graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, got a PhD and an MD, um, and then subsequently trained as an anesthesiologist and an intensive care physician and ultimately joined the Harvard Medical School faculty. Uh, I sort of took a parallel uh, trajectory. I did a combined degree MD-PhD at Penn, did my general surgery residency at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, went up to Boston for my fellowship, and in 2013 I joined the faculty at the Brigham and Women's Hospital um, uh, and Harvard Medical School. You were a successful couple. You could say that. We, uh, Very successful. We, uh, we were flying at 30,000 feet when yes. the disaster hit, for sure. What were you thinking of patient activism at the time? Well, you know, I, you know I've, thought, I've thought about this a lot because, you know, uh, a lot of folks look at us and say, you know, you're, you're patient ad, you know, activists now, you're patient safety activists. And I, you know, I, I would have liked to think of myself as an activist when I was a physician. I think every physician should be a patient ac activist by as a safety activist, ethics activist by definition. But, but I do think that that ends up getting lost. Um, and, um, you know, I think a vast majority of physicians um, are sort of schooled in, in ego and, in, uh, and, in, and cu are cultured, frankly, to look at patients who are angry or disgruntled as you know, um, crackpots, if you will, for lack of a better term. And I think that that is a pervasive culture in particularly procedure-oriented uh, specialties like surgery. So I think um, you know, my, my view of activism dramatically changed. I mean, I, you know, I can tell you that a lot of folks have accused me and my wife um, of being activists, of being emotional, um, uh, but I can tell you uh, that, yes, this was a campaign of, of emotion, but it was also a campaign of science and ethics, and I think the results speak for themselves. Sure. So. Much was covered in the uh, video and audio presentation. Do you have anything to add? I think uh, they, they pretty much captured uh, the, the picture. You know, um, I think fundamentally the message that um, I'd like this audience to capture is that, is that things do go wrong. It's a complex system. Um, and when things go wrong, um, it's absolutely essential for the system to be able to capture um, these problems. I, mean, I think ultimately, in, as in any engineering system, um, you test the system as, at its extremes. So it's, it's fine to put slogans of patient safety and claim that we're ethical physicians, but when the actual test comes, you know, if you fail that test, then the system has failed. And I can assure you that the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School failed this test pretty miserably. Um, can you remind us how many years the power oscillator had been used in gynecology before yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, to remove fibroids prior to any surgery? Well, well, the practice of morcellation has been in gynecology forever. Uh, it, it actually remains in, more, in, in, in gynecology currently. Uh, the power oscillator was simply a sort of a, a mechanization of that process. Um, and uh, the first power oscillator came into being... Uh, in the early 90s, and in fact, John Camp from the Wall Street Journal did a, quite a nice uh, and extensive coverage of this in terms of the history and evolution of the power morselator and how it was approved through the FDA and how it went into use. But yes, it was about 20 years that this device was in use. By 2013, somewhere close to 50 to 100,000 women were undergoing morselation operations, and it turns out that one out, out of 350 of these women uh, were at risk. So it's 50 cancer. to 100,000 every year by 2013, and, and it was actually on an upslope at that point. So the projections were that, you know, the hope was that every woman would actually undergo such an operation. So after 20 and uh, some years of uh, the use of this power morselator, how many cases of leomyosarcoma uh, had been reported to the FDA by surgeons prior to Amy's diagnosis? Well, I, I'm gonna rephrase your question. So, so uh, how many cases of leomyosarcoma, morselated leomyosarcoma had been, had been reported to the FDA is the real question. Sure. And the answer to that is according to the FDA's investigation, internal investigation and the government accountability's investigation, zero. 
uh, Amy's report. Can you repeat this? Zero. No, no gynecologist, no hospital had bothered to report the oncological complication associated with morselation to the FDA, with the use of a power morselator to the FDA. No individual physician, no individual manufacturer, no individual hospital. Um, and I think everyone in this room hearing that, I think should be infuriated by that. Um, that, is a, that is a catastrophic failure. If you asked a, uh, a doctor, uh, a surgeon, what was the risk associated with the use of the power morselator, what kind of uh, response would you get? Well, you know, to be clear, most gynecologists up until 2013, when the Wall Street Journal started covering this, were considering this a minor technical detail of the operation. So just like a cardiac surgeon doesn't inform the patient of what kind of suture they're going to use, the gynecologists, most of them, did not bother to inform um, women that the power morselation was happening. So literally, um, you know, this, this was a, a modern-day monster. You know, so you're a woman, you go in, you get offered this operation, and you, you, you have an occult or missed cancer morselated. Your cancer's upstaged. The answer is, well, sorry, ma'am, you have a bad cancer now. And that's that. So these women were falling through the cracks for 20 years, and no one would hear their voices. And it's as simple as that. It's a modern-day monster. Can you explain how is that possible? Well, I think that our system, our healthcare system, is on this, what I call this utilitarian train. Uh, you know, we're, we're so much about creating efficient systems, service lines, And uh, I think the cost of that utilitarianism, we, what, we what we do is we justify utilitarianism, these service lines that we create uh, under this um, you know, rubric of informed consent. And we forget to um, step back and ask ourselves about medical ethics. Certainly in the case of morselation, there was a serious uh, violation of surgical principle at work. I mean, you know, it's a fundamental surgical principle that if you have a tumor and it has malignant potential, You cannot, you should not disrupt it inside a patient's body because if you do, it spreads cancer, it spreads this tissue. And that's just an incorrect um, practice. And I think somehow this had entered into the gynecological silo and had been accepted as a standard of care. I think it, it frankly speaks to the uh, lack of a liberal surgical education on the part of gynecologists. They, tr they train in a silo and um, you know, they'd missed it. There is no definitive way to rule out an early stage malignancy in any woman with symptomatic uterine fibroid. Right? That's correct. That, I mean, you know, and therefore? And therefore, you know, if, you, if you can't tell if a tumor is cancerous or not, and a, and a procedure definitively has a risk of spreading that cancer, then you should not do it, period. It's, it's, it's a fundamental violation of the principles of non-maleficence in medical ethics and justice. And if you do it and you justify it on the basis of informed consent, or worse yet, if you justify it on the basis of majority benefit, then you, you're, you've become a utilitarian um, with unhinged ethics. And I think that that's fundamentally what the sort of mechanistic basis of this is, is I think we're, we're looking at an example of medical utilitarianism dysregulated uh, with, you know, in operation without medical ethics sort of regulating it. Yeah. This brings the issue of the impossible informed consent. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Can you say something about this? Yeah, so I mean, we've thought about this a lot, and, and you know, you and I have talked, had several conversations about it. Look, informed consent goes as follows, right? If you're a woman um, and you've, you've basically been told, let's say, about the risk of morselation, that it could spread cancer, but oh, you know, don't worry, you don't have, the chances of you having cancer are astronomically small. You don't believe you have cancer. If the doctor's offering it to you, knowing that the morselation could spread the cancer, the doctor doesn't think you have cancer. But if, in fact, you do have a cancer, right? That informed consent form does nothing to protect you. It might protect the doctor in a courtroom, but you know, I'm not even sure at this point it would. So I think it's basically just sort of a, a device that we use to sort of rationalize and make ourselves comfortable accepting these utilitarian practices under the rubric of majority benefit. So you know, when, and when people talk about, well, this thing benefits the majority, the question is, well, what about the minority? Are we exposing the minority subset of patients to an avoidable harm? And in this case, yes, this was an avoidable mortality risk. So we shouldn't do it, period. We might even say that this informed consent, if the doctor strongly believes that there is no cancer, and of course, I don't know if any natural, normal person who, without being diagnosed with cancer, thinks that they, are, they have cancer. Mm -hmm. So 
it may even give them a false sense of security. An air of legitimacy, yeah. false sense of security, absolutely. You know, you, you've signed the informed consent form, you know, the patient knows everything, and I've told them everything. And in fact, the, the Brigham's first response to us, to our campaign and to the Wall Street Journal, was that we're gonna change our informed consent policy. And the immediate answer to that suggestion was how in God's hell is informed consent gonna protect the next patient who's gonna come across this problem? And that is a colossal leadership failure at Harvard Medical School, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, at our most prized and sort of respected medical institution. Yeah, going back to the lack of reporting prior to Emmy's case, is there any legal requirement for physicians to report adverse outcomes associated with medical devices? So, you know, Amy and I did a lot of work with this, and we were very fortunate to collaborate with several congressmen, with Senator Elizabeth Warren, with Senator Casey, with Congressman Fitzpatrick. And, and you know, uh, I, can, I can tell you uh, with definitive certainty here, individual practitioners, expert practitioners, have no legal requirement to report problems with medical devices to the FDA, none. Can, Hospitals, can you say this again? Yes. Individual practitioners, me, as a, as a physician, I have zero legal responsibility to report an adverse event associated with the use of a medical device to the FDA, period. That's the law. Um, hospitals do, manufacturers do. Yeah. Uh, so there is no legal requirement. What about ethical requirements? Um, so as a result of all this, you know, we, we ended up doing a lot of reading. And in fact, you, you will find it astonishing that if you look in the AMA's Code of Medical Ethics, uh, opinion number 9.032, I would um, welcome all of you guys to get on your devices and search that now. Opinion 9.032 very explicitly states that if a physician, a physician, comes across an adverse outcome, a mortality risk, a morbidity risk associated with the use of a medical device, it is that physician's ethical responsibility to report that problem to the FDA. It says it quite explicitly in those terms. Um, so, yes, there was an ethical failure, clearly. And still, not... A single case was reported for over 20 years, correct? Um, that's what the GAO says, and that's what the FDA says. That's 20 years of 50,000 to 100,000, which means that it's at least hundreds of women and almost certainly many thousands. It's, it's almost certainly hundreds, if not thousands, of women in the United States. It's certainly a lot more across the world um, because this practice is being used across the world. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we are, you know, again, some people, some gynecologists have sort of um, accused me and my wife of, of sort of uh, being shock jocks, if you will. You know, yeah. We're trying to shock people, right? But we are looking at a modern day monster here. This is like a public health problem, right? So, a man-made so monster. What's that? A man-made monster, man -made right? Monster. Look, you know, if a plane crashes here right now, right, what you'll see is like 200 people dead or maimed, right? But if, you know, one woman a day, two women a day here, there, San Francisco, California, uh, you know, Philadelphia, New York, are getting harmed, and at the end of the year, you have 2,000 women at, placed at risk or harmed, you don't see that very easily, right? And but if you see a plane crash in front of you, you know, geez, you know, we should shut down the whole fleet. But when it patients came to need a proxy either with the doctors or hospitals to be the one reporting problems. So if nobody ever reports a problem, you end up with this disaster, right? That's right. And in fact, you know, a lot of patients actually knew that there was something wrong. But I think the system sort of said, well, sorry, you have a bad cancer. Well, what do you mean? You know, my perfectly healthy wife or, or mother came in for benign symptomatic disease, and two weeks later, you're telling us she has this catastrophic cancer, and two months later, she's, she's gone, right? So a lot of patients actually, when we started this campaign, a lot of patients who came out, they, they said, we knew there was something wrong. We, we knew that this is, it's impossible for this to be the case. But the response was, well, no, you have a really bad cancer, and, and you know, we're sorry. You so to, you get we talked about the responsibilities of the doctors. What about hospitals and manufacturers? Oh, look, the hospitals and manufacturers... Um, are, they don't have are, requirements? Are, 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 they do, 100%. The legal, there's a legal requirement for the hospital. So, for example, the Brigham and Women's Hospital was given a letter of reprimand by the FDA saying, look, you should have reported this. You knew this. And, in fact, the Brigham itself, there was a very high-profile case before Amy's that had happened at the Brigham, and they did nothing about it. They, had the, they published the largest series on this complication. Yeah, we're going to cover this like in a few so, so clearly there was a failure on the part of the hospitals and manufacturers, and, and, you know, uh, and literally, I mean, I think this, this will be proven in court because everyone sort of denies. You know, it's like you know, everyone's in CMA mode. Everyone's sort of trying to cover their tail and, and run away from this problem. But the reality is that the court system, you can't lie in court. And, and that's basically what's going to happen. It'll be demonstrated that these uh, manufacturers and the hospital had information that, that was necessary for 
uh, the, the protection of women's lives in this particular case, and they chose to do nothing. Yeah. So, Human, uh, Amy and you, I think, are the only piece people that I've ever met that have been able to force the FDA to reverse approval of devices. Uh, yes, we've been accused of N of 1 policymaking yes. by the New England Journal of Medicine. What do you think are the personal characteristics that help both of you make this campaign a success? Um, well, okay, so, so look, uh, it's a, it, it, is, it is a complex, uh, anatomically complex campaign. It was a campaign. Uh, it had several very important pieces to it. You know, number one is that we, Amy and I both had the language to speak about this problem very sort of um, 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 scientifically and, and, and in clinically digestible uh, ways to public health experts. Uh, so, we, you know, and we were, we were, you know, two physicians at Harvard Medical School with, with credentials to speak about this. That's number one. Um, number two, the press Sorry, listening. I have to interrupt you. Uh, you have to remind uh, people, how long did it take you to figure out that the use of morselator when you heard that Amy had been diagnosed with cancer? How long did it take you to figure out that the morselator was the, uh, the, uh, the tool responsible for it? Well, her gynecologist, I had a conversation with her gynecologist almost immediately after she called me. And, and you know, I, my response was, well, you know, did you get it out in one piece? Because it's a sarcoma and that's the only chance of a cure. And she said, no, I, I had to morselate it. And I said, what do you mean morselate it? And he said, yeah, we use, a, we, we, use you know, we morselate things, right? And so, and so then I knew we were in trouble. And then on the way back, to, back home, I was down at Duke at the time. And at, on the way back home, I, I just did a quick search. It, it took me about maybe 45 minutes or so to figure out that there's a device called the power morselator. The, the largest you know, manufacturer calls the device a gynecare morselator, which means it's specifically used in gynecology. So a general surgeon and thoracic surgeon, myself, would have never seen it. Um, and most of my colleagues had not heard about it. Um, and uh, you know, it took me, yeah, 45 minutes to figure it out, and it's being widely used in, in a lot of women. Yeah. So I'm coming back, constantly coming back. The information was out there is the bottom The line. prior lack of reporting is yeah. just so unbelievably shocking once you understand. What kind of data did you use to raise the FDA awareness of the risk associated with the use of the morselator? Well, there's this very convenient <coughs> government-sponsored um, database called PubMed.gov. You can type in any, anything you like in there. There's a little you know, search box there, and it'll pump give you, you know, uh, results. So it, it probably took you, like, months of work to find out. It took me personally half an hour, and then it took me about 10 more minutes to realize that the Brigham itself had published the largest series on this um, internally. And then Say again? Say again? It took me about 10 minutes. No, no. The follow-up is the largest study the, the, ever the, the done? The largest study describing this very complication was done at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where my wife and prior to her, Mrs. Erica Cates, had been harmed. And, and at that time, Erica Cates... In the here. study done um, by the... the other by the very of Department of Gynecology that actually treated my wife. What was the risk in that study? Um, it was somewhere in the one, one in 400 to 500 range is what And when you talk with the same people, when you talk to them, they said... The well, their response well? initially to me was, was, you know, you guys are incredibly unlucky. You know, this was the gynecological oncologist who my wife had uh, consulted to begin with. And he said, you know, you guys are incredibly unlucky. This is one in 10,000 is the risk. How do you explain um, this unbelievable disconnect? Well, I just, you know, I think that, I think what was happening here is, is there was a, um, you know, th there was a cognitive error being made, and that is that, you know, if you look in the general population, the incidence of Lyme sarcoma is probably on the order of 1 in 10 to 20 thousands. That's correct. But if you actually use the correct denominator, which is the women who walk into the office with symptomatic fibroids, the number there is probably about 50 to 60 times higher. It's 1, one in 350. You know, that's, that's a number that the FDA has excavated. Many academic medical centers, Columbia, Michigan, Kaiser Permanente, have, have now excavated. The, the risk of a woman having a, an occult malignancy um, with a symptomatic fibroid is somewhere in the range of 1 in 200 to 1 in 500, period. Now, if, you know, the AGL and uh, a variety of different gynecologists want to shed doubt on that as if it sort of ethically sort of absolves them, they're welcome to try that. And they are trying that in courts all over the country. But um, it's not going to work. Yeah. Going back to the data for the FDA, uh, you probably hired an army of specialists to do meta-analysis. Um, no, I, I, I took it An to army of one? An arm, well, no, it was, it was clearly a couple of collaborators, for sure. Uh, yeah, I took it to my good friend from medical school, Dr. Michael Pasha Orlo. He is an expert in health literacy at BMC. Uh, we were medical school classmates. 
Um, and I took it to him because I didn't want to give it the air of, you know, sort of emotionalism, uh, if you will. And that's all uh, academic study took through two, three years to do? Uh, it took him about a week to review the literature. He didn't really even do a meta-analysis. He, he just reviewed the literature and, and put it in writing, and he collaborated with a couple of doctors at Dana-Farber, Dr. Suzanne George, and, and they sent an article uh, reviewing the literature with a number of 1 in 415, which is the initial number that they excavated, to the New England Journal of Medicine. So you send this data to the FDA and you got lucky. Uh, a single senior person at the FDA decided to really listen to what you were saying. Well, so, yeah, I mean, it was... Is it, it was, luck or is it... Well, it was a combination of both doing our homework and, and luck. Um, you, know, um, we, you know, I looked at the entire FDA leadership at the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. Uh, Margaret Hamburg herself was the commissioner there. And, um, you know, and I, they certainly all got the information. But the one person who actually got the information and immediately responded to me was was a Dr. Peter Lorry. Dr. Lorry comes from a patient advocacy background. Um, he was um, a, a leading member of the pub publiccitizen.org. Yep. And, and Peter, um, frankly, listened. And about 45 minutes after I sent him the manuscript, he shot an email to me. I didn't know Peter. I had, I, you know, he, wouldn't, he didn't know me from a fly on the wall. And uh, you know, within 45 minutes, the Associate Commissioner of Policy and Planning at the FDA shot me an email back and said, is this published yet? I remember when he was nominated, many uh, health professionals and organizations complained about it. Yeah, well, he's gone now, so. Yeah. Uh, in parallel to your efforts to report the extent of the problem to the FDA, you also launched a campaign uh, and tried to uh, find journalists and politicians and the uh, use of social media. I suppose that all the journalists you talked to jumped on the story. Well, not, not quite. Um, in fact, uh, the first outlet that I took this to was the, was the Boston Globe. And, you know, they, they, they sort of, they thought I was just, you know, making this stuff up. How could this be, right? And, and so they, they ignored us. And then when the Wall Street Journal covered the article, the, the issue, um, the Boston Globe came crashing through the door begging for statements. Um, so, no, it was not a walk in the park. And we, we did get lucky. Uh, we did have the correct language to use. We did um, have some connectivity to folks at the Wall Street Journal, so th they just listened. I mean, they took it to their senior editors at the, in New York, um, and they put some very experienced reporters, uh, Jennifer Levitz and John Camp, on this, and they did a very serious investigative series that led to a uh, nomination for a Pulitzer Prize to them. So I think their, their colleagues understood what this was. And then there was a small but highly respected publication, professional publication, called The Cancer Letter. Yeah that decided to really cover the story. Yeah, well, I mean, look, the cancer letter is a very unique breed of, of, of uh, the media, of the press. You know, they're, they're investigative journalists that cover things with an extreme level of granularity. So yes, Paul Goldberg, the chief editor of that outlet, and Matt Ong, the, the reporter, they covered this story um, with extreme granularity. Um, and, and in fact, you know, in some, some, case, some, some industry advocates and some physicians really uh, you know, uh, tried to accuse them of being biased. Um, you know. Uh, it wasn't that they were biased, it was that they were covering the story in an extreme level of detail in a very balanced way. And I think anyone, I would challenge anyone to read their writings and you'll see that they, they initially start covering the story in a balanced way. And then when it becomes clear to them that there's something seriously wrong here, well, they say there's something seriously wrong here, you know. So. Yeah, the cancer letter covered uh, some other very famous stories, right? Yeah, they, uh, I, I think Paul took down Anil Poti uh, at Duke. Um, so, the, you know, they're, they're serious reporters. That's for sure. And, you know, I think their colleagues recognize that. They and Martha Ma Stewart, too. Yeah, I guess so. I, hadn't, I didn't know about that. But, you know, um, uh, the, uh, Matt Ong uh, was awarded the National uh, Press Club Award for his work on the Morsela Morselation story. So I think good journalists um, are critical to any public health campaign. So the three stilts of this thing were, you know, we, were, we knew what we were saying, the FDA listened, the press listened, um, and... Um, you know. I've, I've heard you say that at some point... <coughs> Good reporters uh, with an ethical compass will invariably become activists. What do you mean by that? Well, look, you know, <laughs> despite the fact that we live in a world where everyone's opinion counts, there are clearly at the, at the boundaries, there are these places where there are clear rights and wrongs. And when a reporter starts reporting and reporting and reporting and fact after fact after fact lines up, then they'll stay, say, state the fact. And if, and if there are people who are opponents of those facts, right, they don't want to believe it. They accuse them of bias, right? And so, and so no, it's not, it's not bias. It's that a journalist at a certain point, a good journalist, at the end of the day, is capable of putting the facts together and saying, okay, here's a clear wrong, right? And so we're going to report it 
as such, right? Um, you know, but we do live in the, in the world of alternate realities and facts, so. Is that what you would say about uh, the article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine? Well, so the New England Journal of Medicine, just for background for those who don't know, um, published an article about my wife and I and about our campaign called N of One Policymaking. It's a famous paper now. Um, it was published by uh, Dr. Lisa Rosenbaum, who's the NEDJM um, um, you know, uh, correspondent. Uh, the title of it was N of One Policymaking. And in that, they, you know, uh, as, as a predominant fact, they, they essentially um, uh, accused the FDA of N of One Policymaking. Now, you know, I don't, I don't know how the New England Journal of Medicine could call itself a self-respecting um, you know, um, uh, clinical journal and say that a one in 350 incidence of cancer upstaging in women represents N of one policymaking. In there, Dr. Rosenbaum also felt comfortable calling my wife and I availability entrepreneurs, which is uh, code for charlatans. Um, so we fought that. I mean, we, you know, we, we argued against it. We wrote a rebuttal. And I think um, you know, we sent some lawyers um, you know, to knock on their doors. And, um, and then you did something else. We, we, we wrote a rebuttal, uh, which the New England Journal of Medicine editors published. Uh, and you complained about some HIPAA violation, right? Well, you know, that was part of the larger story, I think. You know, the details of that are in the press, and anyone interested could look at that, yeah. Okay. Uh, with all it of It was a fight, for sure. Um, with all of this, what have you succeeded to achieve? Well, I mean, look, th th there's some major milestones that we achieved. Uh, as a result of all this, two major, actually a uh, few major insurer, insurance, cover, uh, insurance, insurance providers you know, stopped paying for these operations. United Health, actually, as a result of this campaign, looked in their database uh, at Optum, Optum Labs, and they discovered that they are staring at this monster, that for years they've been funding a procedure that's risking, that's spreading cancers in, in, in women. And so they stopped funding the procedure. The reimbursements went down to zero from United Health, which is how many million, and some of you in the audience will probably be able to tell me how many million people are covered by United. Aetna followed suit. Um, you know, um, so, so I think the insurance industry's response was, was impressive and important. Uh, the FDA uh, did not ban the device, which I think is a manifestation of the corruption at the FDA. Look, the FDA's job, FDA is not a marketing agency. FDA is a public health agency. FDA is supposed to protect, the only stakeholder of relevance to the FDA is the patient. It should be the patient. But what they have is this misconception that, that the stakeholders are somehow industry and, and you know, market, marketeers and, and, and patients. And, and most of the patients who show up at the FDA, frankly, are harmed. So they're frothing at the mouth. They can't even intelligently describe what went wrong to them with them. So there's this misconception that the FDA has multiple stakeholders. The FDA stakeholder, the only stakeholder at the FDA should be the patient. So you have so written about medical utilitarianism. 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 Yes, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> very hard word for yeah. a French person yeah. to say. As the cause of okay, this you did, whole, you did well. This is the cause of this whole disaster. What do you mean by that? Well, look, utilitarianism as a concept is a fantastic thing, right? The <coughs> benefit of the majority. We want to do things that benefit the majority of the people, right? But the question is, when you do things that benefit the majority, the question always has to be, what about the minority subset that don't benefit? And if they don't benefit, do they get harmed? And is that harm avoidable, right? If you can't ask those questions, and if you can't subject your utilitarianism to ethics, then medical utilitarianism will become business, will become a money-making business. And with our healthcare system having a massive conduit into our insurance investments, what happens with utilitarianism is our insurance investments will get sucked dry, and with it, the minority subsets of people here and there who fall to our service line mentalities, you know, will lose their shirt. So what's next? Well, I think my challenge to this audience and to Medicine X, you know, I mean, this is Stanford and, you know, folks come up with new technologies, you know. I think that, um, you know, it's nice to talk about diplomacy and collaboration and kindness and empathy. All those are very, very important, okay? But, but you know, look, patients need an army, you know? I mean, the reality is the vast majority of doctors have beneficent intent, right? But the vast majority of doctors are also subservient to a system that's becoming increasingly utilitarian. The system, the healthcare system needs feedback from the market. The, the healthcare system needs feedback from individual patients, okay? Um, the, the labor unions of the 30s and 40s accomplished that. The models are out there, you know? 
So, I, you know, I think, I think uh, yes, the challenge is to have empathy. The challenge is to have these beautiful, shiny hospitals and, and talk about how we're going to create systems that are incre increasingly efficient and safe. But unless the market provides feedback, which is what our campaign was, our campaign was one giant signal delivered to the healthcare establishment, okay? That needs to be codified. Patients need some sort of a, for lack of a better term, and, uh, you know, Jill has critiqued me on this. Uh, the, the word union is, is something that's synonymous with corruption these days, right? It's like labor unions are corrupt, right? But, but you know, that, that at, at its inception, labor unions actually, you know, defended and protected people's lives and livelihoods. You know, I think patients need something like that, not to become adversarial to the medical establishment. You don't want to be, a, you know, uh, it's, not that, it's not that you want to be adversarial to your doctor. The doctor, you know, has beneficent intent, but, but when on the flip side, you have utilitarianism driving these business models, right? Where the purpose is to make money, and the patients are essentially, for the most part, not the vast majority of patients aren't doctors. They can't articulate what the problem is. You know, you, you, you put someone in that maze, um, who's going to defend them? Who, you know, who speaks for the patient? The assumption is that the doctor would, but I think that's an incorrect assumption. I mean, just because the f folks sitting in this room think about it, I mean, what a minority subset of physicians are sitting in this room? You know, the vast majority of doctors, okay, don't think in those terms, especially in procedure-oriented specialties. I'll be, I'll be quite honest. You know, our, our, our specialties in surgery and in, you know, most procedure-oriented, uh, you know, uh, specialties works based on RVUs. Your paycheck, your promotions have to do with how many procedures you do per month, okay? When you have that pressure on you, medical ethics is going to come in second. Um, and so... You know, I think that the challenge to this audience is to, to wonder and to ask, can we actually create what the labor unions created for American workers, for patients? Thank you. Our time is over.